Welcome to Embedded, a show about the many aspects of engineering. I'm Elicia White. My co-host is Christopher White. This week, we are talking to hardware and software engineer Philip Frieden about his OSH chip, a way to make the Internet of Things easier. Before we get started, Planet Labs. You remember them? We talked about them last year. They make satellites that image the entire Earth daily. They're looking for embedded engineers to work on their onboard software for their newest flock of satellites. Your code can go to space. I went to Planet. I got a tour so I can say some things from experience. These are people you'd want to work with. We had Alvaro on the show not too long ago, and Sean was on the Amp Hour about with his robot pet. That was hilarious. You should check that one out. They are both really nice people. In fact, everyone I met there, I wanted to talk to more. And the tour, it was all satellites and art, space and beauty. It was really kind of cool. It made me want to work there, though the commute to San Francisco is not in the cards for me. But for you? Well, now's your chance. Go get your foot in the door. Take a tour. Apply. Check out their careers page, planet.com slash careers. Email them. Email them with embeddedfm at planet.com and I get credit. Yay. Don't be shy. And for putting their job advertisement in the show, Planet is letting me give away their stuff. Two copies of my book and two t-shirts will be awarded. They may also send some of those Planet emblazoned laser-etched coasters. But I'm going to skim them for myself, so I shouldn't have mentioned them. To enter, email. Tell me where you would put your satellites. Where would you point them? Would you check out the glaciation and monitor global warming? Would you look at river mouths and how they're pretty sedimentary patterns go and try to work out what that means for shipping. Weekly images to curb illegal deforestation. Hmm. Daily pictures of sun-drenched white sand beaches. That'd get you through the afternoon doldrums. The winner will, of course, be chosen randomly, so these are all just for my amusement. Get your answer in by April 22nd and go over to planet.com slash careers and apply for a job. Oh, email us, show at embedded.fm, you know, you know, or hit the contact link, whatever. Hi, Philip. It's great to see you today. Hi. Really glad to be here. Ah, could you tell us about yourself? Um, so, I'm an engineer that uh, I do a mix of uh, hardware design, software design, um, and systems architecture. I've lived here in the Bay Area for about 31 years. I've worked for advanced micro devices as a CPU architect. I worked at Xilinx uh, doing architecture of FPGAs for um, about five years. And for the last 20 years, I've been doing uh, um, engineering, both uh, writing firmware and designing hardware uh, for various companies in the, in the Bay Area. Cool. Well, let's get to lightning round. And I know you know what that is, where we ask you questions and we ask for short answers and then we all blow it because we ask for explanations. I'm totally unprepared. <laughs> Philip is in the studio with us and he went through the list of questions. So he may actually be prepared. Uh, should we bring back the dinosaurs? No. It's the first no we've gotten. Makes you want to ask for more, but I'm going to go on instead. Ah. Uh, Kyle or IAR? Kyle. Uh, what programming language should be taught in CS101? C. Really? Absolutely. Do you listen to podcasts? All the time. And which one is your favorite? No, no, no ingratiation required. So I'd say I have two favorites. It's uh, uh, this podcast and the Amp Hour. Nice, nice. Very diplomatic. Yes. Well... <laughs> Favorite processor, living or dead? Uh, AMD 29000, and a close second is AMD 2900. Okay, I don't know what either of those are, so, so brief. So back in the bad old days, um, when people were trying to design CPUs, uh, and they didn't have you know just everything on a single chip, they used something called 2900, which was a uh, 
also referred to as bit slice. So if you think about the architecture of a computer having a register file, an ALU, a shifter, and maybe some I.O. control, bit slice is a four-bit slice vertically through that architecture. And then if you want to build a 16-bit CPU, you put four of them side by side. If you want to build a 32-bit CPU, you put eight of them side by side. Okay, so, you know, I mean, eventually uh, the ability to put more transistors on a chip made that architecture irrelevant, and so everything came onto a single chip. Um, but, you know, the earliest, uh, you know, 32-bit mainframe type computers uh, all used bit slice type technology. Um, and also bit slice was where uh, all the microcode uh, got written. So the bit slice architecture was a microcoded architecture. And so you wrote, you know, so if you wanted to build something like a, a PDP-11 or a DEC VAX or a Data General MV8000, there'd be a row of bit slice chips, some memory that held the microcode, and that then customized it to be a specific architecture. Cool. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Yeah, me too. Right. The other processor, uh, just as much a favorite for me, is the AMD 29000, which uh, was the first commercial RISC CPU. And uh, I was one of the architects for that processor. And it pretty much nailed the, the, the lid on the coffin of the bit slice products. <laughs> so the bit sliced products and their killer. Yeah. I was actually brought into the 29,000 team as the um, loyal opposition because <laughs> I was you know, a born-again user of 2,900 and microcoded architectures, and that's antithesis for, for risk. And so you know, I was brought in as the uh, loyal opposition, but um, I'm more faithful to doing the right engineering than uh, being tied to a specific architecture, and I could see the writing on the wall. And uh, I was given a fairly responsible position within that team and uh, did quite a lot of uh, very interesting stuff uh, on that architecture. And yet that's not what we're going to talk about today. Why? <laughs> why, why, why not? Yeah, yeah, I understand. <laughs> uh, right, I have unlightning lightning around. Is FPGA design hardware or software? Uh, definitely hardware. All right. Are you hardware or software? 50-50. Um, uh, I'm not asking this. Uh, is Australia up or down? Um, Australia is down. Ooh, <laughs> I thought with that accent we get a different answer. Uh, Maybe that's just a, you know, I a, left Australia. A forecast. <laughs> I left Australia for Silicon Valley. I've never regretted it. Hacking or making? Um, making. Okay. That was a lot of fun doing the lightning round but i have a surprise for you i brought a few of my lightning round questions today uh-oh okay you ready yeah okay one word answers no discussion <laughs> you like that ever happens <laughs> <laughs> favorite brace style um, for functions or for uh conditionals mm -mm. i'm inconsistent <laughs> uh, okay well open brace should always be on a new line Except for else's. And ifs. I'm, I, I go back and forth with my current client. <laughs> you you, you yeah. know that, that brace styles have names. I know they have names, but I don't remember what the names are. There's Josh and there's, there's Katrina. Big and there's Indian brace style and little Indian brace style. <laughs> there's wrong and there's right. <laughs> yes. We prefer the right method. One, not one true brace, brace style, one uh, TBS. I generally conform to. Conform to uh, surrounding code. Yeah. Hexadecimal or octal? Hexadecimal. Hexadecimal. Okay. <laughs> okay. No question. How many copies of KNR in your household? At least three. Do you have any down here? No. All right. What was your first computer? Apple II+. Plus. I want to say an Apple when I was little, but it was never my computer. So my, my first computer was an HP Omni book in college that I bought with my own money. Christopher went to pick it up with me, didn't you? I have no idea. First oscilloscope. 
It was an HP, and it was an HP oscilloscope, and it, it remains my favorite. First oscilloscope used or owned? Oh, good question. Used would be some very old CRT thing yeah. in college. HP, probably. I can't remember. All right, no names. No Tektronics? Tektronics was later. First programming language. Basic. AppleSoft Basic with a close second 6502 assembly. Yeah. Favorite Pentamino. Is that a horse? It's a horse, right? I think it's a horse with five legs. The correct the correct answer is <laughs> is R as in the letter R. Okay, we're gonna need to some background on what a Are pentamino you sure it's is. Not a pirate? I mean, yeah, favorite. pentamino is the most wonderful pentamino in the game of life. Right, right. Conway's game of life. Yeah. Okay. Is there a compelling reason to use C plus plus in an embedded system? I Are you trying to get me in trouble? Desperately wanted C plus plus last week. It wasn't even with a screened system, but we we were doing three different kinds of memory and we needed to track things in all three kinds and they were only subtly different and i found myself truly annoyed to be copying code and i didn't have a good way to interface them separately so i really wanted to use a class last week and after talking with dan saxmore about type checking and some of the simpler ways to get into c plus plus I am starting to find myself annoyed to be stuck in C. So, yeah. Good answer. Y yes, compelling. N no, it's not a requirement. Okay. I did I did nudge my client and, and say this would be better in C++, and uh, they don't care. So <laughs> I did not stamp my tiny feet and say, you have to do it in C++. Is that it? Yep. Good round. All right. So let's go into the question. Um, what is a day in your life like? I sleep in. <laughs> Eventually I get my act together and I'll, you know, go set up the, you know, get to the computer and look at the, you know, what's on my list of things to do. And I'll just, you know, start working. Um, I often, uh, I'm very much a night owl, so I sometimes won't start work until six or seven o'clock in the evening and work till maybe four or 5 a.m. in the morning. And I really like that because I don't get any interruptions. I can get in the zone and just really, you know, just soldier through whatever technical challenge I'm fighting with. Uh, okay. So what is in these boxes that you've brought? So I brought, since we're talking about OSCHIP, I thought it might be worthwhile to bring an OSCHIP with me and give you one to have a look at. So I will now hand it to you. It's hard to reach across the room with these boxes. We're all in corners so that we can um, have our mics separate. But look, you get to hear me unboxing things. Isn't that cool? Uh, tell us about the OSCHIP. Okay, so OSCHIP is uh, a, an idea that came to me uh, on the 4th of November in 2014. Um, I'd been... You know, just doing general hobbyist type electronics, putting stuff together on proto boards, sending uh, designs off to uh, uh, Oshpark to you know create PCBs, and um, I'd, I'd been thinking for some time about uh, how electronic hobbyist uh, type stuff has changed over the years. Um, you know, I started as an electronic hobbyist. Uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, it's certainly served as a wonderful education along the way. I mean, that's been my, my career now. But, uh, you know, there's been some, some dark times when the hobby seemed to just sort of fade away and then it came back. And I was looking at um, the types of technologies that I use as a professional and some of those which are not really accessible to hobbyists, things like uh, uh, fine pitch uh, uh, circuit boards, uh, so many of the surface mount components. You know, when I grew up, all the electronics was through hole and, you know, you could see the stuff. Nowadays, when I drop a resistor on the 
on the floor. I don't even bother looking for it because I'll never find it. Um, so there's just a bunch of technologies that as a professional I use, which are maybe just out of reach for hobbyists, certainly the smallest of the uh, surface mount parts, uh, any of the BGA or um, you know, no lead type packages are pretty difficult to work with. Um, let's see. Oh, the other one is uh, RF design. Since I've done a lot of work uh, with 2.4 gigahertz RF, the actual design of circuit boards, uh, antennas built in, etc., uh, can be quite difficult. And so what I wanted to do is uh, come up with a product that basically encapsulated the stuff that was difficult but still exposed all the exciting capabilities to a hobbyist. And in the process, I also came up with this idea of making it like an integrated circuit uh, just as a packaged device. And so that was the, the origin of the OS chip idea. And so it's a, a BLE chip. Right. That looks like a, a dip package. Yes. And and so it looks like one of those old old style where old is it's, like nineteen yeah, called a sixteen pin dip. All right. D- dip stands for dual inline package. Kind of like the basic stamp. Was Very the, similar. Yeah. Breadboard compatible right. device. Yes. Did a bunch of things. Mm-hmm. But inside this chip looking thing, um, there's actually a board. And lots of other pieces that allow programming and um, all kinds of BLE sorts of things. Right. So I'd, I'd like to just take a step back. So if when, when I started working with electronics, a, a 14-pin and 16-pin dips were standard technology. So I came in at the point where the dip package was standard. And typically you got something between four and 100 gates worth of logic per package. So if it was a four input, four and gates, you got four gates. The most complex thing you could get in a 16-pin package was a four-bit counter with preload, which might be equivalent to 100 gates. Uh, OSH chip is physically the same size as that, and it's probably got more than a million gates in it. It has a quarter of a megabyte of uh, flash memory and 32k of RAM, and you know something that I always do is you know I reflect back on my history when I had my first personal computer, which was you know the size of a tower PC these days, maybe a bit bigger. Um, it had 4k of 12-bit memory, and and the processor had one register called the accumulator. Uh, whereas OSH chip, which easily I could hold a handful of them, right? I mean, it's a 16-pin dip, is a 32-bit processor, as I said, with a quarter of a meg of flash memory. I mean, that was the size of our disk drives back then if we had a disk drive. So it's a massive amount of processing power in a tiny package. And the company that makes the chip, Nordic Semiconductor, also puts on a normal uh broad selection of peripherals, just as, you know, Atmel or Microchip does. So OSCHIP actually is a general purpose processor board. You could not even turn on the Bluetooth radio, and it's still an amazing amount of technology packaged, really, into a tiny package. Now, lots of other companies make uh, products with the same processor chip I'm using, but almost all of them are surface mount packages in themselves. So you still need to go off and um, uh, make a PC board before you can use any of the other modules. There are a few breakout boards, but I have to admit the DIP package is very alluring. It it just, it's one a throwback to simpler times, Mm -hmm. but more than that, it is encapsulated in a way that looks finished, not like a breakout board that usually looks like, okay, I stopped halfway, now you package it. Right, yeah. So I, I designed it specifically to work with these white uh, breadboards, and 
the, the typical breakout boards have these uh, 25 thou square rectangular pins, and those actually damage those breadboards. Plus, they're difficult to push into the breadboard because of the size. The breadboards are designed for IC pins. And so uh, a major part of the engineering effort, um, way more than I ever expected, was the effort to actually design the pins that Ostchip uses. I, you know, That's very surprising. When, Sorry. <laughs> when we talked, when, when Philip and I talked about Ostchip, and he said this breakout board thing, and you're not supposed to just shove pins in, I'm sitting here going, you're not? But I do that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think we probably have some severely damaged boards. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if you push it in and just leave it there yeah. forever, you're fine. But if you're plugging and unplugging those types of connectors- It's probably a limited that, cycle count. That right. Yeah. That. Because the, the pins get sprung apart. And in fact, the real problem is when you put something else in like a normal IC- Oh, and that's going to be loose. Or, right. Yeah. yeah. Or you'll Poor just contact. have, yeah, you'll have faulty connections. But one of the problems with the dip packages is is you have to have the, the grippers to pull them out or you bend them. Yeah, you've got to be really careful. Um, I usually just go in with a small flat blade screwdriver at each end. That's okay. I, sure. I, that is what I do, but I, I figured that was wrong. I have done that yeah. incorrectly. You yeah. have to go in from... Both, both, both sides. Yeah, you have yeah. to go in from both uh, ends. Otherwise, and you just bend the back ones yeah. back. Yeah. The, the normal thing that goes wrong if you try to just pull chips out with your with your fingers is you'll manage, to, it'll be stuck, and then it'll suddenly come through free. It'll flip up, and you'll end up with a row of inline holes in your thumb. <laughs> Never done yeah. that one. No, I, oh. I've done that one. <laughs> <laughs> and and so it's painful. And the pins on Oschip, I'm sorry to tell you, are actually pretty sharp. And so if you're not careful, <laughs> you can get a row of precision placed 100,000 spacing holes in your thumb if you're not careful. Uh, I'm sure in California we'll have a warning label for that soon. Uh, great. <laughs> yes. But inside this is a Cortex-M0. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 32 bit ARM processor. Okay. And when you send it to people, how do they program it? What is their unboxing experience like? So their unbox. So I'm embarrassed to say that this is far from finished in terms of where I want to be with Oschip. So for someone who already understands how to work with the Nordic chip and has already worked with other uh, eval boards for Nordic, then they'll unbox it and they'll know what to do, which is probably just connect it up to their compile or GCC compiler and off they go. For people who haven't got that experience, I'm, I'm working diligently to make that experience better. But at the moment, there's, there's not a lot of help and there's a lot of placeholders on my website that are tutorials coming soon, but not there yet. Not there yet. Um, so my, my long-term goal is to actually have a very large range of compiler options, all with their own um, uh, tutorials, etc., so that someone can work with it regardless of, of what their environment is. Um, my, my go-to design environment is the Kyle compiler, which has a eval version that you can download for free from Kyle's website. And it has it has a restriction of 32K of compiled code, which means you're only going to use a small part of what Oschip potentially has to offer. But I've been working with these Nordic chips for, I don't know, four or five years, and I've yet to write an application that blew the 32K limit. So on the Nordic chips, do they have... I know on some of them you have to download Bluetooth. You have to have the Bluetooth right. firmware as part of your code. No, this is not the case. In- no. Okay. So, so yeah. So Nordic has this very interesting concept called soft device. So normally you think about devices like a UART or a counter timer, and it's just part of the hardware built in. The Bluetooth hardware and software combination uh, is is their way of delivering a flexible and evolving. Uh, implementation of the of their Bluetooth standard. So the chip has uh, the critical hardware that you can't get by without, but the rest of it 
is software which gets loaded into part of that flash memory, and they have several different versions of soft device depending what you want to do. So if you wanted to do just a Bluetooth device, they have one soft device. If you want to do a Bluetooth uh, central, which is typically done by a, by a, a phone, uh, that's a different soft device. Um, they now seem to be merging towards a single, uh, somewhat larger soft device that does both functions, right? So that can be as big as, I, I think, somewhere between 80 and 100K bytes. And you load that in to the low end of memory of, of the 256K. And then your 32K of your code then sits above that. So in fact, you know, all of the overhead of the code space that the, the soft device takes up doesn't cut into the 32K of what you're allowed to do. And that soft device seems to run at least a basic scheduler, not a full RTOS, but it has a lot of RTOS features, um, um, timers and whatnot. So it, so some of that stuff is actually just the general resources of the processor that it has to, that it needs as part of implementing the Bluetooth standard, right? There are uh, scheduling uh, type things that Bluetooth has to do to maintain a link, uh, so it, it uses some of those resources as well. Um, and I think you can do other soft devices that are in the 2.4 gigahertz range. I think right. Ant was the other big one that works with heart monitors, heart right. rate monitors. Yeah, so the, so the actual 2.4 gig radio that's in OS chip, well, it's in Nordic's chip, is uh, able to do four different protocols. There's the Bluetooth low energy protocol, There's which is... Very much targeted at the health and fitness market. Wearables. Right, wearables. Yeah. There's Ant, which is the precursor to this, and Nordic has always been uh, a primary supplier of the silicon for the Ant protocol. So uh, it made sense for them to continue supporting it with the with the chip that I'm using. So that's a different soft device. Um, it turns out, actually, you can't run the pro that protocol, though, on OSH chip because Nordic actually sells two different variants of the same piece of silicon, one that allows the ANT protocol to run and the other one doesn't, right? And it's, a f it's like 20 cents more expensive for the ANT one, and that 20 cents goes back to uh, the ANT company, I guess. Licensing. Right, as licensing, right? So there's a mystery bit somewhere in flash memory, Right, that that the ant uh, soft device will check to see if it's on the right piece of silicon that you know caused twenty cents to go back to ant ant central. Right. So anyway, that's the second protocol, and as I said, uh, the Nordic chips can handle it if you buy the right variant. I've had only one customer ask for it, and so my choice not to include it doesn't seem to have been a bad decision at this point. Um, you know, and it meant you know twenty percent, twenty cents less for my cost of goods. Uh, the other two protocols are something called um, Gazelle and uh, Enhanced Shock Burst. So these are both proprietary protocols that Nordic has had in their previous generation of products that used eighty fifty one microprocessors, the twenty four LO one and twenty four LE one, and. Uh, those protocols actually, uh, they use the same band as Bluetooth, low energy and Wi-Fi, et cetera, but they actually run significantly lower power if, if you're careful with what you're doing. And those protocols are actually used by companies like uh, Logitech and Microsoft in their wireless keyboards and mice. So you know, there are millions of chips out there running this either enhanced shock burst or gazelle protocol. That is a marketing coup, enhanced shock burst. Well, there was the less enhanced one. Well, <laughs> the regular shock burst. It's less painful, but yeah. slower. Mm -hmm. Okay. Who is the audience for Oshchip? So very much my goal has always been uh, the hobbyist. So I've never had the idea that this would be a high-volume product. Um, it was really designed... 
as I said, right, to, to do several things. The, the main one was just encapsulating technologies that are difficult for hobbyists to work with. But I would say almost as important to me was I've been frustrated watching uh, hobbyists working with environments like uh, Arduino and you know other environments where the only debug they had available to them was uh, flash a LED or do a printf. And the, the technologies of proper um, being able to single step through your source code, set breakpoints, watch variables while the process while the processor is running at full speed, that whole environment just doesn't exist for hobbyists. And so very much from the beginning of this project was I wanted to enable all of that for hobbyists as well. So I, I would say that it, 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 my goal is still, I, I want to serve hobbyists, but I want to try and give them access to tools that they are not being offered by other people. So you know, I don't think you'll go out and find any other uh, processor boards for hobbyists where the recommendation is go use the Kyle compiler. It is a bit of a big step to start with. Kyle is not entirely obvious, and both Kyle and Nordic have a huge number of examples, which is fantastic for a professional engineer, but a little overwhelming. Right. So so on my to-do list will be the tutorials aimed at so so the problem is the the Nordic stuff is not a their documentation and whatever is not designed for hobbyists, right? It's designed for professionals. So I'm going to take it upon myself to create the tutorials to introduce hobbyists into that environment. How about the open source tool chain, GCC Eclipse? So that's also something I want to support. Um, fortunately, several of my early customers are actually already taking that part of the problem on because um, I haven't had time to do it. So uh, so for OSCHIP, there is uh, obviously a website, which is OSCHIP.org, but there's also OSCHIP on GitHub, right? And so just GitHub slash OSCHIP, and there you will find... Uh, not only all of the design files, schematics, uh, Gerbers, etc., for OSCHIP because it's open source, but you'll also find some projects done by some other uh, people other than me that are hosted now within that uh, uh, directory structure. So one of them has gone off and worked out how to get the uh, Yotta compiler system, which is based on GCC going. Um, another person is, uh, I guess, doing a, an Ubuntu, uh, you know, just bringing it up under Ubuntu. And uh, my contribution in that area is I've done the minimal to bring it up within the embed system. Oh, okay. I was going to ask about embed. Of course, that has the problem that you were mentioning, that it's blink light or do printf. You don't get to look right. at the registers or any of the things you might really want to do. Right. So the, the embed people are, are working on that, but they've, you know, they, they have different goals from me. Um, the embed uh, system has a very broad range of products that are all uh, uh, licensed as embed enabled. Well, it's ARM. ARM does embed, and so right. it's ARM chips, basically. Right. So there is a certification process to go through to be tagged as an arm bed enabled product, and OSCHIP has all the resources to do that other than me having the time. And so I haven't I, – I know what needs to be done. I just haven't done it yet. But as an interim thing, because OSCHIP uses exactly the same chip as Nordic's uh, primary development board, which is an embed enabled board, you can basically go to the embed site and select the Nordic uh, standard development board as the target board. And then from my GitHub account, you can download a uh, replacement header file that basically just says, here is the new pin assignments. I mean, that's really all that's changed. 
right? So it's a bunch of pin assignments. Oh, and there's a trivial startup function that reassigns the UART to a different pair of pins. And there's an example program that blinks LEDs, unfortunately, but it does show, you know, you can basically just go to the embed site and within five minutes, you can have it compiled and building a, a project that downloads into OSHIP. And so that one's not space limited, but it is sort of debug limited. Right. Yeah. It doesn't have the debug stuff. That the, the other thing that the embed environment has is a very good uh, tutorial and set of libraries for Bluetooth low energy. It also has a lack of dependence on what operating system you're running. Right. I mean, people ask, why Why do I suggest Embed when it has so many disadvantages? And that's because I don't have to ask you what operating system you're running. Right. If you have a browser, you can run Embed. And sure, your code is on their site, but if your code is open source, what do you care? Right. You just have to download it occasionally so you have a backup. So, yeah. Yes. I think that's good. I was uh, uh, One of my questions for you was marketing and being Embed enabled, you at least get on their page. You said you have customers, um, and I know yeah, you have a TV store. Uh, what, how are you selling it? How are you doing the okay. marketing? So I'm doing very little marketing myself. Um, uh, there's obviously getting onto a podcast like this with you is wonderful. And the Empower had you on not too long ago, a little uh, bit. They briefly mentioned oh, my product yeah. uh, last year. Uh, I actually was on the Empower, and if – if people want to hear a very strange podcast, it's number 103, which was, I think, two or three years ago. Um, but uh, I would say the, the bulk of my uh, marketing help came without my asking for it from uh, the Hackaday site. Basically, around middle of last year, I started a mediocre job of documenting my OSCHIP project. I realized I was just doing a lot of stuff that might be interesting, in particular, just the design process, getting the pins designed, et cetera. And so I started documenting it on the Hackaday IO site. Um, I entered it into the Hackaday prize. I'm amazed I didn't win. Um, <laughs> I don't know. There was some other project that had value to humanity, which somehow eclipsed my little project. Um, but uh, right around the time that I was about to uh, release OSCHIP for sale, uh, the Hackaday site went and uh, made my project a featured project on their editorial site, hackaday.com, and they left it up there for about a week. So for about a week, whenever people went to hackaday.com on their homepage, there was a link over to my project on Hackaday.io. And then a week or two later, um, Sophie Kravitz, I don't know if you know her. Oh, yeah, Sophie. Yeah, yeah. So she started a new, I guess, monthly newsletter uh, this is in late January of this year, uh, which goes out to 110,000 Hackaday members. And she went and put uh, OSCHIP on the front page of that. So uh, basically, with no effort or even request on my part, uh, <laughs> several people at either Hackaday.com or Hackaday.io uh, basically got the message out about the product to 100,000 hobbyists. Well, it's gratifying too, because that in and of itself is kind of a validation that somebody finds this interesting enough that they want to tell somebody else about it on your behalf without you even prompting. Yeah, it was, I, I could not have dreamed of having a product launch that good. Um, it was just phenomenal. So, you know, that was kind of the initial burst. Um, at the time they that that happened, I did not have a proper uh, storefront. So I had a website that said, here's the product, and it said, send me an email if you want to buy some. But <laughs> you know, the actual exercise of setting up a storefront was yet another web exercise I hadn't yet committed myself to. But I'd always had in the back of my mind that Tindy might be a good option, and so I spent some time staring at the options available to me. So sell on Tindy, 
sell via Amazon, uh, sell directly on my website, or sell on eBay. Those seem to be the ones that most people sort of pick and choose between. And I ended up going with Tindy for several reasons. Uh, Amazon, I just couldn't make my way through all the rules and regulations and complexity. I'm sure for people who have you know have lots of products to sell and you know are doing high volume stuff, it makes a load of sense. But there was just too much for me to understand to make sure that I picked the right options. Um, selling on eBay, they didn't. I mean, it's certainly a sales site, but there was no clear way that it would people would ever find it unless they already knew about it. Um, doing my own storefront was, again, too hard. And Tindy, I'd be sharing space with a bunch of friends, right? All those other Tindy people selling product, and my product, I think, fits into that environment perfectly. And the actual, you know, now that I'm, you know, I've been on Tindy for slightly over a month, um, you know, not, not you know, any massive sales. I think I've had like 40 or so sales. So I've been getting typically one or two sales a day. And that was one or two sales a day I wasn't getting when I was relying on send me an email. Well, and Tindy has advantages for the buyer as well. A little bit of, of reassurance that you're not fly by night. Right. Um, and, you know, now if you end up with the... I want to say the eye of Hackaday as that was the eye of Sauron. Um, if you end up with uh, some media uh, excitement, it's a little easier to say you go here and here's mm -hmm. a standard way to do it. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and now Hackaday bought Tindy, so sure, you it's can't nice get to be away in the from same them. community. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah this, uh, this company supply frame, I don't understand them. But, oh, but no, just about no one does. Yeah, Even, if, yeah. If, if, every time I turn the corner and I pick something new to do, uh, along comes supply frame and it's like, oh, I'm working with supply frame again. So so although I my praise there was for Hackaday.io, Hackaday.com, right? I mean, in the end, uh, the people that have helped me, Sophie, um, Adam, Chris Gamble, they, they all work for supply frame. Everybody works for supply frame. Appar Any day now, I'm going to work for supply frame. No, that's not true. App apparently so. <laughs> um, you already do, you just don't know. Right. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's it's been an interesting exercise of of getting into making a product for sale, and you know, learning all about the the challenges of you know managing a supply chain and 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 a sales you know path, and uh, Tindy Tindy doesn't do a lot of things. It basically is a storefront and payment processing. I'm still left with manufacturing the product, doing quality control, writing the documentation, tutorials, oh, and fulfillment, right? You know, putting things in little anti-stat bags and putting them in a box and taking putting them, them to the post office. Taking them to the post office. And initially that took a lot of time, but I'm getting good at it now. And so it now takes less amount of my day now. Is this an important part of your I don't want to say career, plan, life, job, job, work. It's all I do now. That's pretty cool. But I, I, I've stopped doing consulting because clients were driving me nuts. <laughs> do you think that's a break, or do you think this is how you're going? That once once Oshchip is is I, done ish, you'll go on to something else. I'm. Not expecting Ostchip to ever be generating sufficient revenue to sustain life, yeah. um, but um, I have enough savings that it's time for me to take a break from having to deal with with clients. Um, you know, I've I've had some. I had a pretty rough experience with my last uh, client, and so Ostchip is a very welcome change from that and. No, I'm getting I'm getting on in years, so you know, I may you know just slide into just no longer con calling myself a consultant and just do Oschip because it's a lot of fun. You know, you can change your title from consultant to inventor. I mean, you've got plenty of patents; you can back it up. That's that's true. Um, yeah, I could. I 
I don't know. Undecided. <laughs> it's so funny how people are very attached to their identities. You've I, been I, a consultant I, for so long. 40 years. Fliptronics yeah. has been around for 41 40, years. Yeah, yeah. Fliptronics has been around 41 years, but some of those years I worked for real companies, but consulting for 20. Yeah. And so we've been consulting for a while now. A little while. Christopher, comparatively. Christopher leaned forward as though he was going to come up with a number and then he didn't. Uh, seven. seven. Seven things. Seven. Seven things. Uh, babes. <laughs> um, you were a little longer, but you took a break. Yeah. And we get a lot of questions about people wanting to do consulting, asking mm-hmm. for advice on how to get started. Do you have any? Yeah. I, I, I also, when I got established as a consultant, got lots of questions, uh, you know, via email of, you know, um, about consulting. And so I actually wrote up a page on the topic titled, So You Want to Be a Consultant. And it's on my Fliptronics website, which is an absolute embarrassment. I created it back around 2002 or 2003, and I haven't been back. Uh, but the site is still there, I know, because I keep paying for it. And so... <laughs> well, it's so you want to be a consultant, not so you want to be a web designer. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, so at fliptronics.com, um, in the tips and tricks area, there's a section titled, So You Want to Be a Consultant. And it talks about my experience as a consultant. It talks about how to set rates. Uh, it talks about... Um, how to select clients, uh, in particular, how to avoid drowning victims. Um, mm-hmm. And it says here are the things to recognize, you know, if you see this, any of these characteristics, you have uh, uh, a drowning victim client and you need to walk away because uh, you don't want to be taken down with them. Um, so anyway, it's it's somewhat dated, but the last time I looked at it a few years ago, it I didn't feel any need to update it. So most of the rules still basically stay the same. Uh, In my consulting career, I have focused on always doing something different. So if I've done a project where I was, say, doing a medical imaging application, if that client asked me to do another one of the same, I'd tell them, I'm sorry, I've got another client now and I'm moving on. Um, or if a different client came to me with a similar project, I'd turn it down. So every client, every project I've taken has been different because I want to continue learning. And so there's the skills that I bring as a consultant where I know my domain, which typically was FPGA design. And so that's my value added to them. But I'm selecting the client because of the domain they're in is something I haven't worked on before. So I've worked, and and that gave me a lot of uh, flexibility that I didn't have when I worked at AMD or Xilinx, where all I did was basically, you know, the next generation of whatever it was I was working on over and over again. Um, As a consultant, I got to uh, work on very varied projects. That's one of the things I like best, is the different applications and and being able to get into a different world, even if I'm still doing, you know, embedded systems or signal processing, that part's pretty consistent. But whether I'm doing medical or industrial or trying to optimize for power or try to optimize for speed, it's just, I like, yeah, I like to learn yep. the different things. A- absolutely. That's one way not to get too burnt out with it. But it is still, I find that I do get a little bored because companies sometimes will hire me to do things they can't do internally, but sometimes they're willing to pay me just to do things they don't want to do internally. Mm-hmm. How do you how do you balance that? Oh, so that's interesting. Um, I it took me a while to to come up with. Um, I don't know if the word understanding, trying to word this nicely. I don't believe that there's any such thing as a consulting job that you don't want to do. There are just consulting jobs where you didn't pick the right hourly rate. 
<laughs> there is some truth to that, yes. Right? Yes. Right? All you have to do is adjust the rate to the point where you don't mind doing that thing that you actually don't want to do. There is a limit. There were some, sure. but no rate, oh, no rate in the universe. Ab- absolutely. <laughs> I've, and, and I have a list of those yeah. too, right? For instance, I won't work. I've, I've been offered jobs several times that I've turned down working for patent trolls. Um, I refuse to do that. Um, there were some jobs that were uh, basically expert witness type uh, things, and I just didn't want to get pulled into the adversarial uh, environment of being an expert witness and you know arguing with other expert witnesses who have the opposite view of something. Some people love those jobs. They oh. want to know how to do them. They want to get into that field. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds awful. Well, some people thrive in that, and you know, and I know quite a few people like that. Yeah. And you know, some of them wanted you know to offer me jobs, uh, you know, to bring some of my expertise, and yeah. You know, I had enough other options that, uh, you know, it was easy to say no. Um, in in the consulting work that I've done, my clients typically bring me in for expert skills in a very small domain. Uh, typically, DSP, uh, highly parallel DSP on an FPGA, and my clients typically had a significant number of other very competent engineers that I would work with. So I always enjoyed working with other smart engineers and I had, you know, just my narrow field where I was, I was brought in. What you were referring to of sort of where they just use you as another body. I try to not call that consulting. I call that contracting. That that's yeah. that's that's the way I differentiate between the two, and so I was very careful that when I saw something that looked like contracting rather than consulting, I didn't get involved. That's smart. I mean, to some extent, the contracting is a retainer for the consulting. I mean, for the for the project I'm working on, they need my skills for a little bit of it, but they don't know when that is, and they're willing to pay me to do other stuff just to keep me around and. I'm amused, but not enthused. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so it's it's a dicey proposition. And there's a good chance that I will wander off and try something else soonish. But um, sorry if you're listening to this. I hope I hope you don't recognize yourself. Um, wow, ways not to quit a client. <laughs> Number one, tell <laughs> do, them on your podcast. Yeah, do, do it on <laughs> this will never air. Yeah, do, do it on the air. <laughs> um, the, the other thing that I. I think I came late to the game to recognize uh, in consulting was make sure you're not the smartest person in the room. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I love working with really smart people. Right. So, well, but the, the, the it's, yes, there's you know, the fun of working with other smart people and bouncing ideas backwards and forwards, especially if you, if you've got a really good client, they bring you in at the early part of the project when the architecture is still undecided or you know, not yet fixed, because that's when your domain experience may help f- make the architecture better. Whereas if they don't bring you in until the architecture is fixed and now they need you to do your bit, then if they didn't create the right foundation, right, it's difficult to do the right thing. Um, but the other reason to make sure you're you're not the smartest person in the room is there needs to be someone to hand off your deliverable to who can actually understand it. Yeah. Otherwise, you will be on the hook supporting it forever. I've even had that happen when I've quit full-time jobs where a couple of months later, somebody would say, oh, yeah, would you mind coming back and helping us with this? Because you were the only person who wrote it and knew anything about it, and they had a small team. Right. Um, which you know is an opportunity to do consulting if you feel like it, but it's an also an opportunity to be drawn back into something you previously escaped. Yeah. So, how has consulting changed over the last twenty years? Not at all. Really. Not for me. Bay Area being the Bay Area. Yeah, I mean, my clients are all almost all what I would call um, 
large capital equipment companies. So they're typically companies that are building boxes that cost a million bucks or more for a machine that gets stuck in a fab, you know, row after row of that machine, right, doing some you know, silicon processing step, right? And so I will have worked on you know, something deep within that machine. Uh, there are probably 10 or 20 other engineers who also worked on the project, right? I did the the Vision FPGAs or, you know, some DSP function or something that's in the middle of it. Um, but yeah, so my, my clients typically have been big companies, right? And, you know, that's, you know, that's the silicon stuff, but the medical imaging company I worked with, you know, again, had a lot of very smart people. Uh, and the same can be said of almost all of my clients. So what do you do with your downtime? Electronics and software. Oshchip isn't your first uh, project like this, is it? Um, this is the first one that specifically targeted hobbyists. The previous project I did uh, also used Nordic chips, um, and that was a sad failure. Uh, technically, it worked. The software worked. The, the hardware worked. But... Um, it's the the cost of the end product uh, didn't warrant uh, the additional functionality it had over its over what it was supposed to replace. So it was a it was definitely a marketing failure. What other ones have you worked on? Um, those are the only two products that I've tried to bring to market in recent times. I did some stuff you know thirty plus years ago, which I barely remember. One of the things with Oshchip is that it's not only the platform we talked about. That's correct. You had to make it easy to program. And that's one of the things Arduino and some of the embed boards have done very well is you just hook them up to UART and they are both programmed that way through usually uh, some drive-like interface to mm -hmm. put the code on. And then there's a print, a, a, a serial terminal that you can debug on and so it's a very self-contained mm -hmm. thing sure but with the chip form factor you had to build something else yes so os chip as i said is a 16 pin dip uh, sized product doesn't quite look like a dip because there's an obvious pc board but it's pretty close it has a little four pin connector on top that's um you know, it was the smallest connector I could find, and four pins is the minimum you need to implement uh, the ARM SWD debug protocol. And so there's that little connector on top, and then there's a companion board that you need to buy uh, to go with OSHIP, which is the programmer and debugger, which I'm just holding this up. Right, It's that little board, and it connects with that cable to the top of OSCHIP for doing debug and programming. And then when you're finished, you can unplug it and you're left with just the program chip. The interface that it presents to your computer uh, is over a USB cable and it looks, it shows up as uh, a USB memory stick. And so when you run your compiler, the final thing that comes out of your compiler is a compile and link process as a, dot uh, hex file and you just drag and drop that file onto the virtual uh, USB drive and it then automatically goes through the process of getting it into the chip. So unlike some other products where you have to have a special download program running on your PC or Mac or whatever. That would be open OCD for those of you trying out GCC. Uh, right. Um, or, you know, AVR Jude or other, other type stuff. For OSCHIP, you don't need anything like that. All you do is just uh, drag and drop the, the hex file onto the virtual disk drive. And that's more like embed. It's exactly like embed. In fact, it's, it is embed. So what about connecting Kyle to it? Do I have to have my own? Nope. So Kyle, can, so Kyle compiles to a hex file, and so you can just copy that hex file over at when the compile finishes. And you can make that copy. Uh, part of the Kyle compile environment is you can set up uh, automatic uh, 
operating system commands that run when the compile finishes. And so you can just make that copy part of the you know, single button click to do a compile link and then copy to the target drive. But Kyle also has another uh, thing, which is their debug um, API, which uh, supports many different types of programmer debuggers. Uh, the most common ones people know about are Microlink from Kyle themselves or JLink from a company called Sega. Now, those debuggers are very sophisticated and have some really amazing capabilities, and they are priced to match, you know, starting at about 300 bucks and going up to a few thousand dollars for those debuggers. But that API for doing debug includes something called uh, CMSIS-DAP. CMSIS is um, Cortex Microprocessor something, 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 uh, diagnostic and access port DAP. So the OSCHIP programmer debugger implements that SIMSYS DAP interface. And so with, within the Kyle environment, instead of selecting Microlink or JLink, you select SIMSYS DAP, and then my uh, debugger programmer board will show up in that environment. And that then lets you do downloading, but also downloading and then running within the debug. How much more can the other debuggers do? I mean, when we talked earlier about... Real-time trace at full speed, uh, tracking power in parallel with execution at full speed. Uh, there's a uh, something called SWO, single wire output, which allows you to uh, monitor some internal stuff at the processor without hitting breakpoints or slowing it down. Isn't that just called a GPIO? <laughs> that's un that's under program control and requires you to write code. And it does slow down the processor a little yeah, bit. Yeah, just so. a bit. But those are seriously, um, like you said, advanced features. I, I hardly use those or haven't used those very yeah, often. I don't think right. I've ever had a compiler and a debugger that could both do them. I've got some of the right. more expensive debuggers, but my compiler... Right, the tools, the software tools to fully utilize Trace cost another... You know, right. yeah. mega buck for licenses. Right. So, but but the cool thing about the Kyle eval version, right, is providing you can sit your program within thirty two k. It'll do all that, right? You get the full experience, right, of of what the you know best in class tools are. You know, I've used that Kyle compiler for a serious development, and didn't even realize. I mean, I figured none of those super features came along. I just used it to compile to my 32K and I didn't really care because my product was small and I wanted to use the other flash as logging space, which you can and, do. And, and you weren't making any mistakes, so you didn't need a debugger. <laughs> no, no, no. I, there was the debugger. I mean, there was the step through. Although once you put on that soft device, it's not trivial mm -hmm. because you can't stay in a breakpoint for very long. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so that seems like a feature. And the, the debugger alone seems sellable. Are people buying mm -hmm. that part without yes. the OSH chip? Mm -hmm. Sure. Because it's the, the, the output side is the standard SWD, which is an ARM standard for all of them, for all the processes that run uh, the SWD. Well, I guess it's a circular argument there. So, <laughs> so the Cortex M0s. Uh, M3s, some of the M4s, not not all the Cortex processes, but all the new ones all, I believe, use SWD because it ties up less pins than JTAG and can and can run faster. So uh, this is, a, you know, it's an SWD debugger. If you already own a JLink or a Microlink debugger from Kyle or Sega, then you don't need to buy mine, Right. Conversely, if you don't need all of the performance that theirs offers, but you do want the basic SIMSYS DAP debug capability, you could use mine with either other Nordic boards or with uh, even non-Nordic products. The drag and drop programming only works for the processor I've used because that's kind of built in. In this box you brought me, yes, there is one of those. Yes, there is. 
I wonder if it will work with some of my other processors. Yes, it will. My other compilers. I have plenty of JTAG boards, but or soft SWD boards. Um, mm-hmm. But sometimes people ask, you know, and it's hard for me to say, go buy this $500 thing. Mm-hmm. It's just not, and these are 25 35 35 I think even the cheapest J-Link stuff is 150 there's, there's an educational one, which I think is like... Uh, I have it I, up here. Um, it is 40, 50, 60 US, 42 euros. Um, then I remember getting a J-Link, sort of a so, 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 weird so, so, board so, from a Nordic kit. Right, so, so that's J-Link, yeah. So that was J-Link Lite, and yeah. you can only get that from a licensed seller of dev boards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sometimes the dev boards embed it too. Right, and then... So the so if you're doing a commercial product as opposed to a hobbyist product, so you can't you so you shouldn't be <laughs> using the educational <laughs> version, which you can also get from I think like Adafruit and SparkFun may sell the educational version of the Sega J Link Lite. I think the commercial version is maybe around three hundred. And it probably performs better than my product, but not ten times better. Actually, the J-Link base is 378 US, okay. so it is just over 10 times. Yeah, and I can assure you that the difference isn't a factor of 10. Yeah. By the way, the design for my debugger is open source, and I didn't do the design. It's actually from ARM. And yet, we're all still wandering around trying to figure out how to ask people to so, buy us $1,000. Right. And, 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 and the problem is they did this lovely open source design but they didn't want to manufacture it. Wimps. Those well, wimps. no, they've got other priorities, right? And so, Oops. you know, I talked to them and I said, so can I just copy this design and sell them? And they said, knock yourself out. And <laughs> Shocked nobody had done it before. Right. And so I looked at it and you know, I made some minor tweaks, nothing significant. In fact, the, the actual firmware that runs on mine I didn't write it. I mean, the ARM, ARM wrote a version of it, but the variant that I'm working from was written by someone at Seed Studio. Yeah, I don't right, think it, this is the only one. I mean, I think okay. there have been oh, others. There, oh, yeah, yeah there, there are a few others. There's no one else using... I don't think there's anyone else using the most recent firmware that I'm using and selling it as a separate product, right? The, the, the firmware I'm using, as I said, it came from Seed Studio. So there are some Nordic-based boards from Seed Studio that have the same processor that I'm using, but it's embedded on that right, board, right. and the board is two inches by three inches, right, versus my board, which is, you know, a third of a square inch. All right, well... Uh, let's see. What else should I ask you about? So there's a second v- what I call view for uh, Oschip. So I'd like to at least just drift off into talking about the name of the product. So Osh stands for open source hardware. And so I have published everything that I can about my product on, and you can find it all on GitHub. So uh, schematics, design files, Gerbers, etc. cetera. Um, if someone wanted to copy it all and put me out of business, I'd be sad, but you know, I'm committed to this being open source. Um, but the second part, chip, is really there for two reasons. One is I've packaged the thing to physically look like a chip, but this is described not nearly well enough yet on my website is I'd like to start the process of teaching uh, or enabling hobbyists to become chip designers. And this is very different from anything that I've seen anyone else do because everyone is like, go find an application and then go write the embedded design to, to match it. I'd like to take a step back and talk about one of the ways that chips are sometimes designed, which is you have a generic processor product, maybe with some specialized hardware, and then you customize it to be a saleable product by putting custom firmware in it, and you put a label on the top, and to the end user, it's not even apparent that you're buying a generic part. 
This is not new uh, approach to designing chips. It's been done, I guess I first saw it back in the late 70s, uh, where there were companies that were buying the the early generation single chip micros, the 8048s and 8051s, and they'd load in special firmware and then you know silk screen a new label on the top and call it a product. Right? This is the same idea with the same constraints, right? If you want to build a four input you know, sorry, four NAND gates, OS chip isn't going to be a suitable platform because it's not fast enough because you're limited to what a processor can do. But if you can think up a chip that has four, no more than 14 IO, has a 32-bit processor with quarter of a mega flash and a whole pile of A to Ds and counter timers and all sorts of other bits and pieces. If you can dream up a chip that might use those resources, then you could write the firmware, document it with a data sheet, and then put it in a catalog for other people to use. And so my long-term goal for OSHCHIP, the website, is to be the infrastructure to support a community of hobbyists designing chips and making them available to other people. So the website will do things, not now, but in the future, where it will help you create the data sheet by automatically uh, formatting it for you, uh, filling in all the electrical specs, because I already know what those are, um, guide you to how to write the uh, the front page, the, the bullet list, the make sure you've got some worked examples, etc. But at the end of the day, a hobbyist could come up with a design, submit it to the site. There's a validation process that is not yet in place. Uh, but at the, end of, at the end of that list, the design would be accepted and put into a catalog for anyone else to be able to look at the source code for the chip, but also just download the hex file and use it directly. And so if I made a chip that was a BLE motor controller to be used in a standard robot platform. Perfect example. Okay. So, so you take your skill of specifying that project, you go talk to your, some of your friends and brainstorm about what the feature set should be, you make sure it fits into 14 pins and the available resources, create the design and upload it to the site. The benevolent dictator will then review your design, critique the your source code, tell you to comment it better. Um, it'll guide you to a section of the website where it'll let you create the data sheet. So it'll give you um, an online text editor with formatting, etc. At the end of the day, you'll hit the submit button, right? It says, okay, I've now uploaded the design. There'll be a bit of a back and forth to get it approved, right? That is, I will have exacting requirements of, you know, what your design needs, how well you document it, both your source code and the data sheet. But if, you know, I mean, I want this to succeed, so I will help the end user get to that goal. Then, the, my, then what happens is the design will be allocated a part number. So as a badge of honor, Right, you will be your your design will be given a part number which will read something like seventy four RF BLE one two three four, and forever that unique part number will be associated with Alicia White's BLE stepper motor uh, robot controller chip. Right, and then anyone can go find that chip, download the hex file. They can download the source code and create a derivative product and upload it to create the a derivative part. And if that other person creates that derivative part and it goes through the approval process with its own modified data sheet, it'll get its own unique part number. Okay, um, just as you've seen on some uh, forum sites, as a reputation system associated with people on forums there'll be a reputation system associated with being a chip designer. 
Okay, so as you design chips, you'll get reputation points for, you know, I've designed three or four chips or whatever. Over in the forum area, where people are going to be hopefully helping each other with these chips, if someone submits a question and someone else answers it and it gets accepted, then the person who wrote the answer will get a reputation point, not as a chip designer, but as an applications engineer. So what I want to do is actually take all the, the common um, roles within a chip company and have them exist in this open source environment with OSCHIP as the delivery platform. Do you envision more OSCHIPs with different hardware in them? Absolutely. This is a pretty grand scheme. Yeah. I'm looking for people who want to help. <laughs> Volunteers, I imagine. Volunteers. I'll, I. It is pretty neat. And where have you heard of any uses of OSHCHIP so far? Um, so I don't have, I, I can't talk about specific cases. Um, the biggest surprise for me was that more than half of my OSHCHIP sales haven't been to hobbyists. They've been to professional developers who see OSCHIP as a way to trim two or three weeks out of getting their prototype started. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you have a limited time to market. If somebody's already done all this work for you mm -hmm. and made it open source, might as well try it out. And if it works... Yeah. I've used dev kits and prototypes. So yeah, that's definitely nice. Yeah. Right. Um, I should actually mention that you know, I gave a lot of kudos to Hackaday and you know, the various people there that helped me. The, the other people who really surprised me in that I figured I was too small a customer to matter was Nordic Semiconductor. So they put an editor and a graphic artist on a project and did a press announcement for OSCHIP that they then sent out to 20 or 30 magazines in Europe. And so... Um, That's exciting. Yeah, and in fact, some people have commented on the, I, I guess I would call it the banner photo on, actually, it's actually the best version of it is on the Tindy site, not on my, I guess it's on my own site as well. It's the, the, the really nice picture of the OSH chip. And that actually was done by uh, the people at Nordic. It makes sense. What you're doing makes their chip so much easier for other people to right. just try. Yeah, so that was a surprise. So it was picture. late last year, one of my, my, my primary contact at Nordic, when he saw this product, got all excited. I said, I told him, this is for hobbyists. He says, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I've got customers who are going to want it. And I didn't believe him. Right? Arduino is not, I mean, Atmel loves Arduino, not because... It's a hobbyist thing, but because it gets people working on that. And once it's compiled and running on this chip, you might as well continue because it's working. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, so he actually saw my product being successful with commercial customers way ahead of me. I mean, I you know, certainly, you know, have spoken to him since and congratulated him on understanding my product better than me. But yeah, about half of my customers are... Uh, commercial companies uh, that the the reason that I'm even getting traction here is that everybody else who's making modules so there are lots of people who make you know breakout boards which are you know two or three inches on a side and have you know the square pins but for all the miniature variants the the things that are under an inch by an inch those modules are all surface mount which means you still got to make you still got to make a board before you can you can turn them on, right? I did something with the BLE Nano that was sort of cool. Yeah, so the BLE Nano has a, is a module sitting on a board. By the way, when you search in Google for BLE Nano and you misspell it Nana, it gives you bananas. Oh, good, I just thought you good, should know that. Good to know. I, I, <laughs> that banana <laughs> meme is really getting tired. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so the BLE Nano. 
It's small, and uh-huh. it has a sec- secondary programmer. I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I believe they use firmware that is very similar to mine, except it runs on a Freescale M20K. Uh, the programmer piece? Yeah, on their programmer piece. Um, I don't see this Because the firmware there. that I use, I'm running it on an NXP... Uh, LPC 11U35, but uh, this, this is the stuff that was you know, originally written by ARM, and but it's it has at least three different target processors, and one of the other ones is the M20K. It is the M20K. Yeah. MK20. MK20, yeah, close enough. Yeah. Which is now part of NXP. I don't understand what's going on. Um, companies are swallowing companies. Yeah, consolidation, and then we're gonna, and and then products that you desperately depend on will be taken out of the data book. I have one more question for you. Sure. Um, if you were in college right now, what would you focus on, or what would you advise someone in college to focus on? Well, that's two very different questions. Say whichever one okay. you want. <laughs> Um, for college. So what I'd focus on really, I think only matters to me. So that's irrelevant. Um, for someone who's in college now, have fun. That's important. So I I think for someone in college, I think that spending, putting a lot of effort and focus on projects, assignments that are done as teams and figuring out how to work in teams is probably a very valuable skill to hone in your career as soon as possible. As painful as that is. As painful as that is. Or can be. Maybe you've got a great team. No, you should work on teams that aren't great. Because if you work on exclusively teams that aren't great, then you're going to be in for a rude awakening. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's, yeah, that the, yeah. Learning how to partition projects, figuring out uh, interfaces you know, in large projects so that people can work on their part independently and still glue them all together. Um, I am a very strong advocate for test-driven development for both hardware and software. Um, I am disgusted and outraged at the number of FPGA designs where they believe the way you check it is by loading the bitstream and turning it on, <laughs> as opposed to writing um, exhaustive test vectors and running simulations and static timing analysis. Uh, so, yeah, if you're doing electronics engineering and digital design, um, a very heavy uh, focus on test-driven development in that environment, I think, is worthwhile. Yeah, especially if you're doing FPGAs in preparation for doing a mass ROM. More ASIC. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to make that uh, qualification. Just any. That, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, I am being IM'd that we have run a little long. Sorry. Uh, no, no, I have totally enjoyed speaking yeah. with you. Yeah, just trim out the stuff I said. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any last thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Hmm. It's been a delight chatting with you, and I really enjoy your podcasts. Thank you. Thanks. My guest has been Philip Frieden, creator of Oshchip, which you can get on Tindy. There'll be links in the show notes, but I'm sure you can find it. He is also the hardware, software, and system architecture consultant at Fliptronics. Thank you for being here. Thank you also to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. And of course, thank you for listening. Please also check out our blog and newsletter. You can find it all on embedded.fm, the website, along with a contact link if you'd like to say hello. Or enter the Planet Labs contest. Don't forget about that. Show at Embedded will help you enter. And if you would rather apply, embeddedfm at planet.com. So I know that's a lot. It'll all be in the show notes. Just go to the website. And that really is enough for this week. A final thought to leave you with. This one is from Robert Heinlein. 
A human being should be able to change a diaper, plan an invasion, butcher a hog, con a ship, design a building, write a sonnet, balance accounts, build a wall, set a bone, comfort the dying, take orders, give orders, cooperate, act alone, solve equations, analyze a new problem, pitch manure, program a computer, cook a tasty meal, fight efficiently, die gallantly. Specialization is for insects. Embedded FM is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive any revenue from them. At this time, our sole sponsor remains Logical Elegance.